do all that we need to do. Good afternoon and welcome to virtually or in person to St. Scholastica Monastery. We are happy to have you here and we are looking forward to uh, our Oblate Nancy Labiak's presentation. Uh, I am Sister Benita, in case there's anybody that doesn't know who I am. And I am director of Oblates and very proud that this is an Oblate um, of ours that is going to teach you and share with you her experience. And I would like to welcome you and all of you who are on the Zoom virtually, please know we count you as being right here with us. We are one. And I would like to begin with a short, or maybe not so short, prayer to set the tone and to remind us of who we are and why we're here. God beyond all names, you are infinite love. We come together to thank you for your boundless gifts. We ask for the wisdom to recognize how we are called to seek peace and pursue it. Open our hearts to recognize your mercy and strength, even in what first appears as earthly hardship or even disaster. 20 years ago today, the horrendous devastation of the Twin Towers in New York resulted in seemingly unspeakable death and sorrow, while it also brought immediate selfless response and the outpouring of care by countless people. The COVID pandemic continues. While hearts touched by your compassion have spread both physical and emotional healing. We will hear today about the hardship of the Camino de Santiago and the profound peace that journey brings. May we in our everyday lives realize all the love you give us in difficult or easy times. All that love is your invitation to us to love others. In that we find your peace. Amen. And now I am going to turn this over to another of our oblates, Barbara Boland. Thank you. Sister, thank you for that beautiful prayer. My name is Barbara Bolin and I'm an oblate. But first of all, I just wanna remind the people who are on Zoom that if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat box. And we'll have questions afterwards also here um, who are present. Again, my name is Barbara Bolin. I am an oblate. I have the pleasure to introduce Nancy, our speaker for today, who has become my friend. Nancy will tell you about herself, but I want to share with you how I met Nancy. I became an oblate about 10 years ago after hearing another oblate, Kevin Shears. Hi, Kevin, I know you're on Zoom somewhere, about the program. I didn't know a thing about St. Benedict. I didn't know anything about St. Scholastica, but I knew that this was a program for me. So about two years ago, I volunteered to be a mentor to someone who wanted to be an oblate. And who do I get but Nancy? So about right before COVID, we began meeting, you meet monthly, and you talk about the different um, things that you, about, about St. Benedict, uh, their teachings. And we met a couple months in person. And then we would meet, because of COVID, we continue to meet. Nancy was very persistent about meeting and FaceTiming. And then when it became safe again, we got to see each other in person. And then about last winter, Nancy became an Ablai. The interesting thing is Nancy knows, has a wealth of information about St. Benedict. She's been very involved in a monastery in Arkansas, which I'm sure she'll tell you about. 
So the knowledge that she gave me was amazing. So through all that, she became an oblate. I understand more about St. Benedict and I, and, I, and I have a new friend. So with further ado, Nancy. And by the way, I did, and there's somebody else here I just talked to who did about a hundred miles of this, um, th this journey that she did the 500 miles. So there you go. Hmm. El Camino de Santiago to Compostela. Translation, the way of St. James through the field of stars. The beginnings, the ancient Celts settled in the area of Northern Spain, which we have here. Um, and they settled there under this incredible canopy of stars, which we now know as the Milky Way. Much later, the Romans came through. The Romans built a road and they passed through what is now Santiago, but they continued on to the sea. And there was a settlement there called Finisterre or the end of the earth. That's what they thought that place was, was the absolute end of the earth. And then we get into the story of the Camino itself. So St. James the Apostle, St. James the Greater, brother of John, son of Zebedee, was sent out to spread the gospel in Spain. He did not do very well. He had very few converts. And one day he gets a, an apparition of the Blessed Mother. Now it's kind of interesting because she hasn't died yet. So it's, it's kind of like by location rather than apparition, but she, she says to him, come on home to, to, to Israel. So he comes home to Israel and promptly gets his head chopped off. Now his friends decide that he needs to go back to, you know, his remains need to be returned to Spain. So he is put on a marble boat that is piloted by angels and is sailed home, landing very near Finisterre. There's a wedding going on on the beach at Finisterre and the horse of the bridegroom with the bridegroom on it was so startled by this marble boat landing on the beach that the horse and the bridegroom plunge into the sea. And just as everybody there is thinking, well, that was a quick marriage, up out of the waters comes the horse and the bridegroom covered in scallop shells. Next. <laughs> Next one, yeah. Ah, the scallop shell. The scallop shell would ultimately become the um, symbol of the Camino, as in all roads lead to Santiago, if you look at that. It was also a, in, in the early church, they used a scallop shell frequently for baptism and a very practical use of it. Of course, it could also be used to scoop water when you were, were walking. So the pilgrims became known, if you were a pilgrim on the Camino, you had a scallop shell with you. Well, to get back to that time that James's remains came to the beach, the queen, the local queen, whose name was Lupa, she was very impressed by, by this scallop shell incident. And she takes the remains of St. James, moves them inland, uh, approximately where St. Santiago is today, and buries them, builds a little chapel, and then everybody forgot about it for about the next 750 years. In the early church, in the meantime, pilgrimage had become a, a really important thing. Uh, but and the pilgrimages, pilgrims were going mainly to the Holy Land or to Rome. Well, of course, Rome fell to the barbarians in the 600s, and Israel, the Holy Land, fell to the Muslims in the 7th century. So th those two routes were kind of cut off for people. And just miraculously, in the early 800s, um, those same Muslims are, are now called the Moors in Spain are working their way up to, to capture Spain. And a hermit slash shepherd uh, slash monk named 
Pelagius. He sees that field of stars above him, but this time he sees them coming down into one spot. And he digs and finds the bones of St. James. So this time, a much bigger church is built. And Santiago, which means St. James, becomes an incredible trending uh, pilgrim uh, destination. The king of Spain, next slide. The king of Spain makes St. James the patroness, patron, pardon me, of, of Spain. And if you look at this closely, you have St. James there, and at the bottom are all those little moors being trumpled by the, by the horse. You know, St. James is keeping at least northern Spain, where, sound, where the pilgrimage can go. He's keeping that safe, and so it stayed that way. Now, through the Middle Ages, two million people estimated walked the Camino, and that was when there was a much smaller population in, uh, in Europe. And they walked from their home countries. They walked from Scandinavia or Russia or England or what have you. And then, of course, they had to turn around and walk back. It wasn't a one-way trip like it is today. And why did they walk? Well, a lot of them were looking for healing. You know, they had diseases or infirmities or what have you, and they were hoping for a miracle. Second group that came, though, were cri criminals. Criminals who were given a choice of, well, no, you want to be hanged, or you can go walk the Camino. And if you walk the Camino, you have to come back with a certificate saying that you have walked the Camino. They called it the Compostela, which means that field of stars again. Okay. Some people walked it to keep from being hung. When they got their Compostela, they'd go back to their home country to the judge, and he'd say, okay, you know, forgiven. Third reason, of course, was a plenary indulgence that you, at all past time in purgatory was all taken care of, and you were going to just get go straight to heaven. Thousands died while walking the Camino. Bad water, bad food, a lot of bad guys, and a pretty difficult passage. Now, interest in the Camino died out with the Reformation. And it came to an abrupt halt when England and Spain were involved in a major war. Queen Elizabeth was queen there in Spain. And she sent her right-hand man, Sir Francis Drake, to Spain. And the Spaniards were absolutely terrified that he was on his way to, to steal the bones of St. James. So somebody sent back to Santiago to hide the bones. Well, whoever it was did a very good job because they were lost for the next 300 years. Yeah. And so in the 19th century, the 19th century, when the walls of Santiago were being restored, they find a pile of bones. But are these St. James's bones? Amazingly, back at an Italian church in Pistoia, Italy, there is a jawbone and a clip of hair of St. James, which is matched up with the bones that they have found. And Pope Leo XIII uh, declared these were the remains of St. James again. This is in 1883. Well, there was not a big rush to go on the Camino again. Um, you know, Spain had two world wars and a great civil war. And it really wasn't until the middle of the 20th century that people started thinking about the Camino. Again, there were several historical books written on the history of it. And about the mid-century, a group of men, uh, they were politicians, clergy, um, and uh, just general uh, businessmen, politicians kind of a thing. They formed a group friends of the Camino, and they spent, they spent time and money rebuilding the, the paths of the Camino and the places that people would stay, these albergues that dated back again to the Middle Ages. So in 1949, 50 people were recorded as having walked the Camino. By 1993, 
10,000 people had walked the Camino. By the time I walked it in 2014, there were 240,000 people that did. And it continued to grow from there until we hit the pandemic and it was closed off. And now quite truthfully, it's kind of sputtering back and forth. They're not quite sure what, what's gonna happen as do we all. So why did I walk the Camino? When I was four years old, my big brother, Jimmy, read me the story of the Camino from his little Catholic reader. And I can still remember the illustration. It had uh, a pilgrim with a very big hat and a broken wheel on a, in some sort of a cart and a very recalcitrant donkey. Uh, and when he got to telling me all about it, I said, someday I'm going to do that. Well, my brother Jimmy died on my birthday in 2013. His proper name, of course, was James. And, well, the Camino is the way of St. James. So it sort of put it in my head again, maybe, you know, partially in memory of my brother, I should do this. But I was also facing a very large crisis in my life. Um, I had a need to let go of a lot of things. Um, I had just completed this amazing home on the corner of State and Randolph in the Joffrey Ballet building. I had bought raw space as the building was going up and had designed this amazing home. I now call it my 15 minutes of rich. But um, my former business partner slash ex-husband and I, yeah, we had major things going on and after several years of hugely legal fees and, and constant stress, I made the decision one day, I just needed to let go. So I, um, my way of letting go was to walk the Camino. I lined up someone to sell my apartment. I bought another cheaper apartment that needed a lot of work up here on Sheridan Road. I lined up a company to put everything in storage if the apartment should sell downtown. I lined up a contractor to start renovating the new one if indeed I got the new one, if the old one sold. I gave my lawyer power over everything and told him I hoped he didn't like Argentina. And I locked my front door and I headed off on the Camino. Next. Now, here is St. James portrayed as a pilgrim. He's got, as you see, the pilgrim hat, big, nice, big old hat, and his Camino shell attached to that. He's got a gourd for carrying water, and he's got a pilgrim staff to help him up and down those hills. Next slide, please. And this is me, present day pilgrim. Uh, I have got a bright orange hat, because I figured if I fell off the mountain, they could maybe find me. Uh, I have a 28-bound backpack to which my Camino shell is attached. I have a little front pack with two large containers of water. Yeah. And of course, my trusty hiking poles. I would have been dead without my hiking poles uh, several times over. Okay, next slide. To walk the Camino and to stay in the official albergues, these places with large dormitories, you have to have what is called a pilgrim passport. So I got that ahead of time. And as you're walking each day, once or twice a day, you have to, you're in a restaurant or your lodgings for the night, you have to get a stamp. And that's to, at the end, prove that indeed you are walking the Camino as you go along. <sighs> now, my official journey began. Began with me, next slide. I drove from Chicago to, well, what has been a, a very important place in my life, Santi in Subiaco Abbey. I spent Holy Week and Easter at Subi. And then one day I went up into the hills, they're located in the foothills of the Washita's. I went up to where the original um, little chapel had been, and I took a stone with me for a ritual that I would knew would be later part of the Camino. So 
had a wonderful Holy Week and Easter. And with the blessing of the abbot, I made my official beginning to, to my pilgrimage. I then though had to drive south to Shreveport, Louisiana and leave off my car with my, some family members that I have there. And I was feeling really icky. I was feeling fevery. And I thought, oh, I better check this out. I go to an urgent care center. I have pneumonia. So <laughs> I took a whole bunch of, you know, of um, antibiotics and I left the next day and got to Madrid and, you know, rested three or four days. And then I took a train to Pamplona and met some people on the train and we agreed to share a taxi for the last couple of hours up to, next slide, Ron Savaye. Um, those of you who have ever been interested in the Camino may have seen the movie, The Way. There are thousands of pilgrims over there who have walked the Camino totally because they were enamored with the way. It's a nice movie. It does not have very much to do with walking the real Camino there, doesn't. Um, but they have uh, in the first, what happens at the beginning of that movie is that this, this guy decides he's gonna walk the Camino. He falls off the mountain the first day. And then his daddy comes over, who's Martin Sheen, and, and takes his ashes and continues to walk the Camino with no training, I might admit. <laughs> I can't do it, but okay. Yeah, that's what the story is. Well, when I was looking at starting my own Camino, I thought, I read about that first day. It's one of the most treacherous days on the whole Camino involving, it's about a 15 mile um, over a very steep, it's, you know, you're, you're in the, yeah, you're, you're in very steep mountains, especially the descent into what would be Ron Savai. And I was starting on April 30th, which was still lots of ice in those hills. So I made the decision to start in Ron Savai, which is in Spain, and it's where all the Spaniards start, and the, um, the others, many others started in St. Jean-Pierre de Port, which is right across the border to 15 miles to be exact to the north. So I am sitting there waiting while people are coming over that last hill and coming down in that deep descent. Many people that day, because of the sleet and the ice, fell on the gravel, gravel on the sleep and, and went home. Yeah, that was... It, 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 I'm, I was very glad that I made that right decision not to, not to start there. Next photo. So this is my first night though in the dormitory. These are huge rooms. Um, you have double bunk beds. So you have two mattresses on the top and two mattresses on the bottom. Uh, there, there, you know, just one piece of board and those two mattresses. And there's no discrimination as to male or female. You are literally scrunched up next to the person next to you. And the first night, it was a very nice guy whose wife was assigned the top bunk. So I spent the night, you know, sleeping with her husband. Um, and I was put pretty near the door. So every time the door opened, it was cold. And with, as I settled in for the evening, I began to just shiver and, and my, my teeth just started to chatter because I wasn't quite well yet. And um, one of the, the, the albergues are run by um, uh, hospilieros, they're called, they're volunteers. In that particular week, it was a, a group of Dutch hospilieros that were running uh, our albergue. And I stopped one of them and I said, would you happen to have a, an extra sleeping bag? And he came back with an extra sleeping bag for me. So I settled in for the night. It was still a little cold, but it was a heck of a lot better. The next morning, I found out it had been his sleeping bag. It was the first of many experiences. I called them my angel experiences. Uh, there is a saying, the Camino provides. And in my case, every time I got myself into something, the Camino did provide. By the way, just also, um, 
you have maybe a hundred plus people, you have about four bathrooms, four toilets, four showers. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little if, if, challenging. Next slide, please. Yeah, here's me on that bottom bunk that first day. So the next day, the next slide. I stood in front of the sign, 790 kilometers, which is just a shade under 500 miles to uh, Santi. I was, it was raining, uh, it rained a lot. But I stood there and I thought, what, I, what am I doing? <laughs> am I going to walk 500 miles? And, and I, I felt totally overwhelmed, totally tea tiny, uh, vulnerable, and then just thought, well, one foot in front of the other, and off I went. I had, um, I had learned, by the way, to, uh, my, my big Spanish sentence was, uh, soy una peregrina perdida, donde es el camino? I'm a lost pilgrim, where is the camino? Which I did use a couple of times. The problem was when they answered me, I couldn't understand them. <laughs> So going to the next, how do you know where you're going? The yellow arrows, you became just focused on yellow arrows and the yellow arrows could be anywhere. Next slide, like in the grass. Next slide, was it just a pretty one I thought again? It could be on the side of a highway. We, we had quite a bit of, of actual highway that you also, you know, with big trucks zooming by. And it sometimes you weren't allowed to walk inside. You had to walk on that little, that little thing that kind of falls down on the outside of the, the rails. Yeah. Next one, please. I liked this one. I, I felt like doing that a lot, just taking off my boots, filling it with flowers and walking away. Next. When you're in the cities though, they didn't do the yellow arrows that cities didn't want their buildings, you know, disfigured with yellow arrows. So they would, in the pavement, they would do the scallop shells like this one or next or that one. So you, you yeah, could keep finding your way. And then next, occasionally, not very often, but occasionally you'd actually have a map. Uh, posted so you could kind of tell where you were going. Now, next. The terrain was ups and downs and ups and downs. Uh, so here's one and up, keep going. Next, another down. Next, a very gravelly, hard to walk path. Next, a nice quiet stroll along a stream. Next, uh, uh, it's, this is on the edge of a cliff that if I fell off, would be very bad. <laughs> next, uh, again, just endless, endless, you know, uh, next, you would you would wake up in the morning and look out and you know maybe you'd see some wonderful beauty next you'd walk underneath some interesting windmills which i had always wanted to see up close and personal next someone snapped this of me i have no idea where i was but just again one foot in front of the other there next more lovely tranquil scenes next and you'd see a town in the distance and you'd think, well, maybe I'll get there for morning coffee, but you knew you still had a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of miles yet to walk. Next. Now here was a biggie. I told you about that Roman road. This was apparently a part of the Roman road. I don't know, these guys had to be giants. When I got up close, each of the risers was almost as high as my knee. Well, there was no way I was going to be walking up that with the backpack. So I had to take off the backpack, throw the backpack up each flight, each stair, and crawl on my hands and knees up the stair and do it until we got to the top. Yeah. Next. 
some incredible vistas once you did get to the top of things. Next. And then there were the bikers. The bikers had their own Camino. They were, had yellow signs they were supposed to follow, but they wouldn't. They insisted on being up on our spaces. And frequently we would be like, here's another one of these ledges and they'd come at you and they'd yell, Buen Camino, giving you time to throw yourself into the mountain while they went by. Next. And hopefully did not fall off. <laughs> they, they were really, really annoying. Okay, next. There were a lot of times, you know, again, I'm 67 years old. I'm not real good at this. I, I am not a hiker. You got to understand. I, I was a pretty good walker, but I'm not a hiker. Climbing up and doing, fording these little rivers and trying to balance with that backpack and jump from one to one. I should probably at this point mention, I have no depth vision. I have what's called a lazy eye. I've never used it, which means everything is flat, which gives me, yeah which makes everything really hard when you're doing 3D things, I can just say. So I, I did make it to the other side of that, barely. Next. And then you'd have days where you'd have fog and you can't see, you know, 10 feet in front of you. And, and then, you know, finding the yellow uh, arrows was a challenge, plus just the cold mist. Next. And I have a personal fear of crossing bridges. And there was this one day that not only did I have to cross a bridge, but I couldn't tell where it ended because I had to walk through the fog. So that was, that was a scary one. Next. This particular day was, was one of the toughest. It was pouring down rain all day. By the way, when you put up the, uh, the, the, you know, this, what do we call that? A tarp. <laughs> This thing that I was supposed to wear, which did keep my kept my backpack dry, did not keep me dry because it had you, you couldn't there was no breathing, so you immediately became all sweaty on the inside. So you sort of just had to decide. I guess it's important to keep the the backpack dry. So we started off on this day next, and we came to what is known as Mule Killer Hill. <laughs> yeah. And that's the descent into Mule Killer Hill. It was raining so hard that there I had mud up to my ankles. And then the mud would sort of, all these rocks would stick to the mud. And so I spent probably about an hour and a half or two, you know, just kicking, constantly trying to kick some of the mud and rocks off to get to the bottom. Next. This would be a selfie of me at the bottom, <laughs> having survived the hill. Next. I was so cold that I went in, there was a little village, I went in, again, I'm shivering, and the wonderful proprietor took me behind the counter and insisted that I put my hands on his little portable heater just to warm up again. The people on the Camino were absolutely wonderful. Would like to say a word here about with the Camino, you lose a lot of your uh, fineries of civilization, I guess I would say. You know, so that first week when it's raining a lot and I'm still getting over pneumonia, I had my little Kleenexes inside and uh, my pockets, but of course I had the big thing majiggy over me and I'd get down there and I'd get the Kleenex and by the time I would get it to my nose, it would be sopping wet. So about the day three or four, I'm just leaning over and blowing. <laughs> nope. Potty stops. There are not nearly enough toilets, actual toilets of sorts. You many times have to resort to maybe finding a tree, but you can be assured if some tree looks good, then a thousand other people have thought that too. Now, I was very responsible. I had in one pocket, a little plastic baggie of clean TP, and then I had another one of used TP. <laughs> so I would transfer. Most people were not so nice. So when you ended up out in these fields, yeah, it was it was it was challenge. Then then of course there was the. I did. This is 
probably somewhere written in the skies. Anytime that you actually found toilet paper in a real bathroom, you stole it. <laughs> you just stole lots of it, stuck it in the clean one, because it was, it was rare, a rare finding. Also learned, got really strong mm, uh, thigh muscles because I quickly learned when I had to go out there to take off the backpack and go was just too much and, and it, it would get wet and all that. So just <laughs> trying to squat with a 29 pound backpack at 67 was a challenge. Okie dokie, next. Some days I got around walking down these, it was the downhills that were absolutely terrifying for me with my lack of depth vision. And several times, instead of walking down a mountain, I would look at a map and I would walk around the mountain. And this particular day, I had looked at the map and I figured eh, it's gonna add maybe six, seven miles, but I think it's gonna be worth it. I had been told, I, you know, again, I read these things, that the descent down the mountain were all these sort of polished granite boulders. Uh, it's not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to do that well. So I start down, this was the last road. I find myself on a road that is absolutely quiet. There are no, there are no trees, so there's no bird song. There were fields, but there weren't any guys and tractors or even cars on the road. I became very aware as I walked that I would, every time I would stop, it was total silence. And the only, when I was walking, the only thing that I would hear would be my footsteps. It was a very interesting experience to sort of experience total quiet in a totally open place. Next. Frequently along the Camino, you did have memorials to people who died walking it, which was always a, a very solemn reminder. Most of them had died of heart attacks. Some died by falling off the mountain. So you had, you had all these lovely memorials. Next. Placed along the way. You'd run into about one a day. Next. Yeah, a very um, sobering reality of the, of the walk. It was not a walk in the park. Next. Occasionally, I take time to smell the roses. In this case, poppies, but yeah. The, the beauty of the Camino is, is pretty amazing. Next. But every time that I'd think, well, I've walked forever. I'd see another one of these things. What this one is, I'm still 581 kilometers from Santiago. You know, just when I think, it's about, what? am I there yet? No, okay, next. Water is a very, very, of course, important thing as you're trying to walk. And there is a segment of the, of the Camino that is called the Meseta, which is a plateau, a desert plateau. Uh, very few trees, very dry. And so every morning I would make sure, I would look at the map and think, okay, this is where I'll refill my water. Um, this particular day, I arrived at the little town where I anticipated I would refill my water only to find out that um, it was a ruin. It was in a town, there was no water. Next. So I have about mm, a quarter of a water bottle filled and I kept going for a little while and I see like a stone, over, there were no trees, stone overhang. And I climbed up in it and just kind of sat there trying to figure out now, what am I gonna do? I don't think I can make it. I had about, about nine, 10 kilometers, six miles to go before town. And up the path come these, these two young men, uh, they were eight, 19, 20 years old. One was Dutch, one was Canadian. And they stopped and they said, are you okay? And I shook my water bottle at them and I said, <laughs> they both insisted on giving me half of their water. My second set of angels. So as they're bounding on up in, in front of me away, I said, you know, 
God sent me to check on you guys to make sure you've got the spirit of the Camino going, just so you know, you know, I'm, I'm the angel of justice or something. Well, I passed them later in the afternoon and they had found one little bush that was out there and were hanging out underneath there themselves to try to make it the last bit. And when we got into town, when I got into town, right on the edge of town was this incredibly wonderful water fountain, which I just doused myself with, filled up all my bottles, sat there and waited for the boys. And when they came in, I said, of course, you guys are the angels. We're going for beers. So we went out and had beer that night. Next. When you arrive uh, in the afternoon at where you're going to stop for the day at these albergues. There's no reservations at the albergues. There are, there are private pensions and B&Bs and that sort of a thing. And I did take advantage of those from time to time, staying in a room with, you know, four, six people, eight people, sometimes even two people. And, um, but a lot of times I stayed in the albergues and you just lined up and waited until they opened the doors. Next, when you finally would get there, you would do your daily uh, laundry. Now, I started the Camino with two pairs of pants, uh, one which was, you know, sort of a capri length, uh, and the other was this long pair of pants that had a zip off, zip off option so they could become shorts. Well, I very quickly discovered that the zips chaffed my legs and I couldn't walk in them. So I unzipped the long part and I tossed it because that was saving me about seven ounces when every ounce counted as far as the lugging thing. And the shorts became my evening wear. But that meant that every day I had to walk in the same pair of pants for 47 days. So, you know, I'd get up there and be washing it. Next big item that you tried to take care of all the time were socks. Trying to get socks. You had, I had this, um, and all of us did, this uh, ritual. Every day you would get up and cover your feet with Vaseline, and then you'd wear a silk sock, and then you'd put these heavy woolen socks on top of that. Didn't work. Next. Yeah, here's the toes. <laughs> Just when you thought another blister could not fit in there, there it be. You know, I lost a whole bunch of toenails and I can't even tell you how many blisters. Uh, you just, yeah. Um, yeah, foot care was, was a big <laughs> topic of conversation on the Camino. Um, but we had so many other aches and pains going, you know, I had back pains and knee pains and hip pains. And I was basically chomping down ibuprofen like they were jelly beans. Uh, that the, the feet, once you started them going, they didn't seem to hurt like everything else did. So you didn't pay much attention to them. Um, a little aside again on that laundry thing, that movie, The Way, we would discuss the way at, at length in the evening with other pilgrims. And one of our real sticking points was the girl, the lead girl wore blue jeans. You don't wear blue jeans on the Camino. You would never dry blue jeans overnight. <laughs> you know, when you washed these clothes, there was not like a dryer. There wasn't a, even usually an outside clothesline. You would have to hang them off the end of your bed. And yeah, she's wearing blue jeans every day now. The movie. Mm. Anyway. Next. Highlights of the evening, though, the real highlights, were many times you had communal uh, pilgrim meals in the little places that you were staying. And it was interesting, the, the pilgrim meals always included wine. And you paid extra for water. Next. And this would be a typical view at night, you know, this is whoever. I was very lucky that I, I every night did get a bottom. They took pity on me and gave me a bottom bunk. Um, yeah. 
but it, it yeah, the, the views were limited down there. I had brought my Kindle and every night I would have to, we, you know, God, I was very glad I had that little backlit Kindle. I mean, I probably only made it through a page of whatever I read, but just that calming influence. I read of course, spiritual stuff and let go for the night. And next slide, headed off 6.30 the next morning. That was, that was the go of it. Now, next. There were an incredible amount of churches, cathedrals, uh, pilgrim churches, et cetera, along the way. This is, happens to be the cathedral at Lyon. Next. You know, this is in Bergos. Again, beautiful, beautiful edifices. Next. And a lot of them were decorated to the hilt with gold and silver encrusted with, you know, all sorts of uh, gems and things, the, the, um, the altars. Next. And next. They were everywhere. And I couldn't enjoy them. I mean, I kept thinking about all the, the indigenous peoples of South America who had died digging out those gold and silver things. So they, they were not my favorite churches. Next. And there were a lot of them. Next. Keep on. There were also the remains of a lot that had been there before, which were kind of interesting architectures. Next. This was my favorite one. Nice and bare and had this very ancient feeling of just peace. So I sat there a lot, a long time. Next. I became enamored. It was springtime, of course, as I'm walking this. And there were all these incredible stork nests. I kind of got into the storks, took pictures of, I think, every stork. So we're going to go through a couple of stork, snork, stork slides. Next. And more. Next. They were just everywhere, just as cute as they could be. Next. I think it's the last one. Next. But there were another kind of bird that was honored upon the, the uh, Camino. And that would be, eh, let me find it, make sure I don't misspell it. Ah, next, it is the Church of Santa Domingo de Calzada. Okay, they keep a rooster and a chicken in their church. And here is why. So there were these three German tourists, a mom and dad and an 18 year old son who stopped in Santo Domingo one night. And the innkeeper's daughter really got the hots for the young man, but he was a pilgrim and he was not interested. So she got even with him by taking a silver cup and putting it in his backpack and then accused him of stealing it. And then that's enough to get you hung. So the poor boy was hung in the in the square. Well, mom and dad were heartbroken, but they went on to Santiago. And they, on their way back, their son is still in the square and he's alive. So they go to the bishop who has just sat down to lunch and they tell the bishop, you know, our son is still in, hanging there and he's very much alive. And the bishop said, yeah, he's just as alive as, as this rooster and chicken dinner I'm about to, you know, knife into. And at that point, the chicken and the rooster hopped off the plate and flew away. And he let them take down their son and take him home. Yeah. So to this day, they remember that by keeping a rooster and a chicken in the church. Next. There are wonderful, again, springtime, many rituals that we encountered along the way, including this first communion, which was just lovely. Next. And the, that, that scallop shell was everywhere in the architecture. It's just fun to see how and where. Next. There was a nice vineyard owner who would, would give wine to every pilgrim passing by. We had to bring our own cups. But yeah, you wasn't really great wine. But, you know, it was, it was a nice idea. Next. And th this was a, <laughs> a, a, a 
chain link fence that who knows where this came from. Everybody would take little twigs and form a cross and pray for their safety. That was one of the rituals. Next. One night I was up somewhere on top of one mountain and there was a, a group of um, daughters of charity and they had a prayer service for us. And this, one of the sisters tied around my neck with a thread, the miraculous uh, Mary medal. And oh, I can't tell you how much I just held to that thing for the rest of the trip. The thread was filthy by the time I arrived. Boy, yeah. Every time I looked at going down another one of those hills, I was clasping that metal. Next. Now, the Iron Cross here is the highest point on the Camino uh, at about 5,000 feet. And I told you way back at Subiaco, I had talk, took with me a stone. And the tradition is that you present the stone and you let go of something in your life. You leave something behind. Um, so the night before I'm to do this, in this little town, I'm looking at the maps and what have you, and I realize that the descent from the cross is gonna be one of those humdingers. Uh, the map that I used, it, it, it used exclamation points, and I had realized that if it was a three exclamation point, I was in trouble. <laughs> this was a three exclamation point. And I had looked around at other stories about the, you know, the day and uh, online and what have you. And I determined I was really putting myself in danger to walk down. But the problem was I could, you know, walk up. I, I can walk up pretty much anything slowly, albeit, but I can. But when I would get up there, there was no phone service. So ultimately I made the decision I was going to have to take a taxi. I took a taxi from the little town up to here. Next tossed my little stone and what I decided that I was letting go of was my pride. <laughs> that I, yeah, I am 67, I just couldn't do it and I needed to do it the way ever it took to do it. So yeah, next. Met many, many wonderful people on the Camino. Um, this, person was um, a French widower who had lost his wife uh, the year before, and they had planned to do the Camino together. And he said, I'm doing the Camino for her, and she's doing it for me. She's walking with me. Next. Lots of young uh, Spaniards walk the Camino. It's just part, they're not terribly religious sorts, but it's part of their history and their tradition, and they're very proud of it. And these two were Wonderful. They, I, I kept running into them all along the way and uh, just great guys. Next. These two ladies we met because we all had matching backpacks. Uh, they were Canadians. We decided that our backpacks were all cousins and, and they have actually become two of my best friends in life. Um, we've, we've traveled together several times since the Camino. Yeah. Next. You also had various wildlife or domestic life along taking up the path. Lots of cows on the Camino and you have to wait until they're ready to get out of your way. Next. And I loved this little guy. It was a day of another day of rain and he just poked his head out of the, out of the barn to take a look. He wasn't gonna come out and say anything. Next. Yeah, this is my friend Wendy and I. Wendy was suffering from tendonitis, and she was the only person I ever passed when we were walking. Next. This is 100 kilometers. At 100 kilometers, um, the last 100 kilometers is all that is necessary to, to get a Compostela. Those 200,000 plus people that walk the Camino a year, 
Something like 65, 70% of them only walk the last 100 kilometers. But the deal is they don't care if you've walked 400 miles, 500 miles, but you must walk the last uh, 100 kilometers. Next. About 50 kilometers, I woke up one morning. It was day 44, I think. And I had, I thought I have pulled a muscle. I can't give up. I can't, you know, I can't give up now. I'm like 30 miles from, from Santiago. So I kept going. Next. On the next day, I, I'm slowed down considerably. The pain is getting worse with every step. I'm kind of using the hiking poles like crutches at this point. And I had started off at 4.30 in the morning to be able to walk at least some length armed with, I have a little headlight that I put on. So off I am into the darkness. And I'm in such pain that I keep just saying, one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. And when the sun comes up, I realize I have not seen a yellow arrow in some time. I am totally lost. So I look at my map and I try to figure out by the way the sun's coming up and whatever, maybe this road will take me back to the Camino. I start down it. Finally, I see a car coming at me, empty car. I wave this woman down. And uh, I give her my big line about, you know, soya, una, paradita, <laughs> peregrino. And she says in perfect but accented German English, the Camino is that way. And she points from the way that I have come. Well, fine. So she drives away. And I think she's a foreigner. <laughs> she doesn't know where the Camino is. So I keep going. I see another car coming. I wave it down. It's her again. And this time she's got, she's got a whole bunch of people in the car. She said, I told you the Camino is that way. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. So she goes, and I keep, I keep going. I cannot, the thought of having to retrace with all the pain I'm in, even a hundred, I just can't do it. Finally, I see her go by. I don't even say anything to her. She's empty at this point. And this empty guy, I don't know what's going on with her going back and forth. The fourth time that she approaches, she stops the car. She rolls down the window and between gritted teeth says, get in the car. <laughs> I mean, at this point, I am slouched by the side of the road, weeping, <laughs> thinking, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't do this. Okay. Camino provides. Angel number three, German outfit. <laughs> so I find out that this particular group, we're traveling together, have been doing this for 10 years. Every, 10, every year, they would take two weeks. They started walking from Heidelberg and, every, they would, and they'd pick up where they left off. And here, they're only now a day and a half away from Santiago. And they had, you know, they had taken, they had a couple of cars, but they were all waiting for them in Santiago. But this one car, they had, the, the group had stayed in various little albergues or, or pensions for the night. And she was gathering them to take them back to the road. So they squished over in the car, gave me a space and drove me back to the Camino. Yeah. Her name, by the way, was Hildegard which I just thought was kind of cool. <laughs> She's the one there in the, in the sort of plaid there in the middle. Okay, next. Now, mm, the last day I had uh, six miles to go, about 10 kilometers. And um, I was, we had made there, various people that I had met on the trip had arranged that we were all going to meet at the cathedral at noon for the big mass. It was going to be a Sunday mass. So I started off at about, eh, about 4.35 in the morning, totally dark. It's, I'm in a forest. I'm totally alone. I've got my little headlight on, but, you know, I'm walking along and I hear this howling. And of course, my first thing is dogs. And then I'm thinking, but we had all those conversations at night about the healthy wolf population. 
And I'm thinking, nope, nobody actually knows where I am. <laughs> I, I, for the first time in the entire trip, I was like, I mean, some wolf could just carry me away and they never know what happened to me. It was absolutely, I just stood there and was terrified. And then, next, I see the beginnings of the sun coming up. No, we can do this. So I, I kept going, kept going. Hit the, uh, the last hill is called the Hill of Joy. And I stood there, looked down at Santiago from the Hill of Joy. Next. And hobbled on down to the edge of town, arriving at Santiago. And my, my friend, Wendy, the one with the uh, tendonitis who was collapsed on that wall with me, um, caught up with me. And together we walked into town. Next. We went immediately to get our Compostela. Next. There it is, me with said, which I've got framed at this point, the Compostela. Next. And there was the marvelous, of course, cathedral, the bells ringing and everything. We went in there. Because it's a Sunday, though, all of the actual pews are taken up by fairly well-to-do Spaniards. So they have sort of roped it off next. And the only place I could find to sit was a, a ledge at the bottom of a column. And I thought, this, this is a pretty good picture of a pilgrim. <laughs> Exhaustion, I cannot tell you how absolutely, totally exhausted and yet jubilant that I felt at that moment. Next. And as it was Sunday, they swing what is called the butifumero, which is this, the world's largest incense burner, which had been created because the smells of the pilgrims were always so bad that, you know, a little incense over them tried to take away a little of the smell. But it's a, it's a lovely ritual. Next. And that evening, we had agreed we were going to meet and get all cleaned up and meet at this restaurant. So at seven o'clock, well, when I walked in, they were all there. They had arrived a few minutes earlier, and they all stood up and sang to me, climb every mountain. They said, every time we passed you, and as I said, they all passed me, they said, you were singing one of three songs. We shall overcome, be not afraid, or this climb every mountain and climb every mountain was the only one they knew the words to so that was that was extremely extremely touching next the next day I rented a car and I drove out to Finisterre next and I sat there at the seaside and watched the sun set and yeah, it, it, it felt official that, that the Camino was over next as the sun slipped into the sea. But now we have the postscript <laughs> next. Oop, there is a next. No, you don't have one next. That's the last. How did we lose that? Okay. Well, I don't need a slide for the postscript. So I was in such pain by the time I finished this, I could not imagine getting on an airplane and flying back home. And my kid works for an airline, so I had an open ticket. I wandered around Spain and Portugal for a couple of weeks, hoping the pain would get a little less. It did not. Finally, I just got on the airplane, flew to Dallas, connected to Shreveport, picked up my car, drove three days back to Chicago. On the way, called my orthopedic guy. And um, he said, um, yeah, he'd see me the morning I got home. And I went in, he did an MRI. We waited for the MRI and he finally came into his office with me and he said, what did you say you've been doing? <laughs> I said, well, this 500 mile hike across Spain. He said, you have an injury suffered by soldiers with have carrying heavy gear on forced marches. I said, yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that'd be about it. He said, it's the downhills that got you. I said, yep. I had a stress fracture 
that had started as a small stress fracture on one side of my hip and has now went to the whole total other side of my hip. He said, you need to go home and you need to sit for two months. And so while I had been gone, my house had sold. Everything that I owned was in storage. My lawyer had closed on the new place. My contractor had started to rehab this new place. My contractor pulled a bed and a chair out of storage and, and they moved that around as they worked around me for the next two months. And in retrospect, it was a good thing because it gave me a lot of time to meditate on what it was I had learned on the Camino. And here are my main three takeaways. Number one, for 47 days, everything I needed was in that 25, 28 pound backpack. Uh, and I felt an amazing sense of freedom and contentment with those few possessions. I had enough. Indeed, I even had an abundance, I felt. I didn't need a lot of stuff. Second, my life, I've led a wonderful, exciting, very interesting life, but it's been filled, just filled with peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys. And the Camino was like that one peak and valley after the other. And I occasionally on the Camino would come upon a flat stretch of, of, of road. And I just appreciated it so much. And I thought about applying that to my life. I've always sort of like turned my nose up at flat stretches, but Camino has been a seemingly interminable flat stretch. And there are things to learn in the flat stretches too. And lastly, I'm quite sure uh, if I had known just how painful, uh, challenging and terrifying uh, the Camino would have been, I don't think I would have attempted it. In addition to the fractured hip, I ended up with permanent nerve damage in my right hand from clutching the hiking poles too tight. And I ended up with um, skin cancer because where the bottom of my uh, hiking pants to the top of my socks, there was about a two and a half inch thing. And we were always walking to the West. And so that sun was always at my back. I ended up with skin cancer, didn't spread, but it, it was a kind of a, yeah, it was tough. Um, and I can't tell you, you know, sometimes just how terrified I was because, because of my eyesight, I just knew I wasn't seeing what was ahead of me uh, rightly. And I was just terrified I was going to fall off and, and die. Uh, I had a fear of getting lost, a fear of failing, a fear of giving up, a fear of not being good enough. I always throw that one in. Uh, and, and then finally, there were those wolves out there. But for those 47 days, it was just me and God out there. Every day, I experienced that loving God walking with me. I only needed to tune in. I believe that all of life is a pilgrimage hopefully a journey towards wholeness. And we are called to walk, each of us, our own Camino, our best Camino, find our particular path, our way, made possible because we have this loving God always walking with us every step. I wish you all a buen Camino. Did we get any questions? Yeah, I think they're walking around with a microphone. You've got one here. There we go. Thank you very much for your lecture. I really did enjoy it. And I apologize for my phone ringing. So one question I have is, 
how many kilometers or miles did you walk per day average? Oh. Can could you can we ask, can we lower the mask when they ask the question? Oh. oh, so how many miles did you or kilometers did you walk work, walk per day? What was your average amount of? There wasn't an average. Okay. Yeah. There were some days that were so challenging. If I did six miles, it was a lot. Okay. And then there were days that I was able to do fifteen. Before I left, I had sort of fifteen was something that I had tried to get up to. Mm -hmm. but those 15 were flat. <laughs> so okay. thank you. And there were several times that I took that taxi. I took a, I took a couple of taxis. I took a bus. I even took a train on a, on a portion that it, the only place that I was going to be able to stay was one of these albergues, which are on a first come first serve basis. And I knew I wasn't going to be there in time. And I knew I could not sleep on cement. So yeah. But I got lost so much, I made up mileage on those. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. What What was your um, intention? What were you, what was your, I, I don't know if I heard that or if you said it, what was your intention of going? What? My intention for mm -hmm. doing the trip? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, the biggest thing was, it was partially in honor of my brother. You're just a remembrance of my brother, but my my really strong, was I needed to let go. I needed to make a change. I needed to just, yeah, my life was being turned upside down and I needed to step away and let go and not continue fighting about something that in the long run was ruining my health. I thought what was so interesting, having of course bought houses, bought houses and sold houses and all of that, that you let you let all of that go, the buying and the selling, and you came back, and it was done. Yeah, it was done. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. I was wondering, how did you pay for things? How, how did, did I pay for things? Yes. Well, it's interesting you ask. Um, I had two credit cards with me. One, I, I had them in very different places so that if I got one stolen, I had another one and I did get one stolen. The first couple of days I was in Madrid when I had pneumonia and I was not paying attention, someone slipped out of my backpack a little thing that had my credit card and my debit card. My debit card being the most important thing because there what you do is you, you what I would do is there were ATMs along the way and you most everything you paid in cash, um, euros. So I would use my debit card. But wonderfully, Chase, it was my Chase card that was stolen. They caught up with me. I you know, gave a space two or three days down the road. And your passport and identification, did you have any Sorry. problems with those being taken? Not quite here. No. Your passport. Yeah, my passport, I have a um, something that I wear around my waist and I had that next to me all the time. And then, um, and my passport was in there and one of the credit cards. And what I would do is I had a little day pack as well that like in the evening, I would just go out with my day pack. When I slept at night, I would put my hands through it and kind of use it as my little second pillow. <laughs> so that yeah though that, that had anything else that was of value there anybody else here we have some questions from the chat um, we have a question about uh, Benedictine places that you might have visited along the way. Uh, the Benedictine house that shares a wall with Santiago de... With, eh, I can't find I, it. Sorry. I, I went out of my way. The, the main Benedictine place that I wanted to visit, and I should have looked this up ahead of time, was about uh, eight miles, eight, ten miles off of the Camino. And I went out there for one night. Um, wasn't terribly excited, but anyway, <laughs> did that. Uh, but I'm, you know, it was interesting. 
Uh, and when I arrived in Santiago, I stayed in what had been a Benedictine monastery, but had been converted into a hotel. Um, you didn't know the history of a lot of the churches. I didn't, you know, they weren't. You had so, you can't imagine how many churches are ruined abbeys, are ruined monasteries. They were just lots and lots of them. And, and a lot of them I just didn't know the history of. And we have two more questions which are related, so I'll ask them together. Um, how, and one of them you uh, addressed at the close of your talk um, to some extent, but how were you changed by your journey? And did you feel, do you feel closer to God during or after your journey? I understood the first one. How was I changed? And, and did you feel closer to God during or after your journey? Oh, God and me were like this the whole journey. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, 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 was, it was kind of amazing to me. You know, I, 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 I'm always trying that present moment thing. <laughs> and say, so would just stand closer focused. to the microphone? Should stay over here. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. I, I, um, I became very aware very early that I wasn't going to make it uh, if I did not really consciously know that God was at my side. Um, uh, I mean, we, it, I just kind of talked all day to God, you know, it, it, it was a very, it was a very intimate experience. In many ways, yeah. And so, how has it changed my life? I think that was the other question. The three things that I mentioned, you know, I have definitely become aware of as far as objects. I don't need that much stuff in my life. Um, I, um, yeah, I'm just so very, very grateful. I guess that's it. And I was grateful for the experience. It was way beyond my pay zone, I, you know, pay grade. I just, I, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but I actually, my, my spiritual mentor in life is, is Abbot Jerome Codell of Subiaco Abbey. And God love him, he wrote me most every day. And one day I said to him, what was I thinking? Why am I doing this? And he said... I think it was because you were afraid you'd miss something. Eh, that would be about me. So, yeah. But it was, it was, I'm so glad that I did it. And uh, yeah. Any other things? Woo. Okay, I know this has a lot. I like it.